up front. Yes. All right. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. Well, <clears throat> we, uh, we've been talking about uh, a lot of things. Last week, we ended in, we were talking, we've been talking about uh, the gifts and, the, and, and according to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 31, it says, uh, but earnestly desire the best gifts and yet I show you a, a more excellent way. And then you get down to uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 and uh, what is the greatest gift according to Paul? And, and it explains there, it says, and now abide uh, faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I'll tell you right now, if, if, if we as a church can tap into what, what, it, what it's like to love and to be loved, like Jesus loves and like God loves, uh, we, will ch we will transform our whole, our whole area. It will transform. Uh, because people are drawn to love. Amen? And so Paul wrote that love endures forever, and, and uh, we talked last week about how we have mixed up the meaning of, of love and, and what love really is and, and how we love this and we love that and we love the other thing and, and we wonder why it doesn't mean too much anymore when we tell someone or, that we love them because we love everything. Amen? I mean, we just love everything now, and so we have lessened we have lessened to some degree what it means when somebody says, I love you. So uh, one thing we do around here, especially during family time, is we hug and we shake hands and we, we tell people that we love them. And, and when you tell somebody that you love them and give them a hug at the same time, it not only is verbalized, but it's, it's, there's a physical element too. Also, and Dr. Dobson talks about the, the power of, of, of human touch. And I, I've talked about it before, but, you know, they're, they're, these little babies that are, that are uh, born to mothers that don't want them, basically, and, and they're, they're, they're just born and they're stuck in a little incubator thing, a little deal, and they're just left there. And oftentimes those babies, they, they, they have what they, what they call failure to thrive. And, and so those babies, they don't, they don't, they don't begin to grow and they don't, they don't get that rosy pink look to them and stuff. They just, no one has touched them with love. It's one thing for a doctor to touch them. It's another thing for someone to touch them with love in their hands. And, and God bless the little old grannies that go in there and take those little babies and, and get in a rocking chair and begin to rock those children. And that baby will begin to sense and will begin to feel that there's love there and they're, that they are loved. And, and that baby will begin to thrive and begin to grow and begin to increase because somebody took the time to love them. And this is what we're talking about. Love is the greatest of all human qualities. It's an attribute of God. If you want to be like God, if you want to be like Jesus, love somebody unconditionally. Love somebody. Reach out to them. There may be somebody you need to make a phone call to and tell them, hey, guess what? I love you. I was on the phone today with, with uh, one of my... Dear friends down in Utah, Mike Young, some of you know who he is. And uh, uh, I'll pray for you. And uh, <laughs> he, he, is, he is a precious brother. But, you know, he was out on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on his bus route this morning and some, a, young, a young person had, had driven his car and lost control and had went off a cliff and and it had thrown him out in, in the rocks, and he was just, he was laying out there, and he was deceased and stuff. And Mike said, you know, I, 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 somebody's having a bad day today. Some family has got some devastating news today that their loved one is not ever coming home again. And, and I'm telling you, don't put off making a phone call to somebody you haven't talked to. 
Tell them that you love them. When I was a hospice chaplain in Utah, one of the things that I always said to the families that I was ministering to is, don't leave anything unsaid. Tell them that you love them. Well, they're completely out of it. You tell them anyway. Tell them anyway. You don't know whether they can hear you or not. Dear Lord, the Lord's after me. There. We won't have to listen to that anymore. You didn't, you didn't follow me, did you? You are awesome. <laughs> I can't get away with nothing. These cameras, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so anyway, you know, uh, love, hmm, love involves unselfish service to others. Now, I don't know how many of you, I imagine most every one of you was here on Sunday, but Linda brought in a box like this full of eggs. Oh, two boxes. I don't know, everybody was packing eggs out of this place, on, and they're good eggs, man. And, uh, you know, that... That's, a, that's an uns... I mean, they could be selling those eggs and making money. That's an unselfish act of service, of love to this congregation. Amen. Amen. I mean, you can, you can say, no, nah, they just had an overrun. No, it's, let's call it what it is. It's an act of love and service to this congregation. Faith, church, is the foundation and the content of God's message. Hope is the attitude and the focus, but love is the action. We can talk about love all we want, but until we put it to action. Amen? Amen. I mean, I'm probably one of the, us, we are probably, I mean, we're, we're blessed. I know I'm blessed. I've, I've, been, I've been given things. I've been gifted stuff. Um, you know, tonight, Rick and Karen, they come in, they bring me a rock with, that, that they've cut, that he cut and polished. It's a, it's a, they're a thunder, it's a beautiful thing. It's got, he wrote a, got a scripture inscribed on the bottom. It's just, I'm just blessed. That stuff's birthed, that stuff's birthed out of love. Church. Faith informs action. Hope influences action. But love is action. Amen? So when faith and hope are in line, then we are free to love completely because we understand how God loves. So does your faith fully express itself in loving others? That is one of the foundational things about this church and why this church, I think, is growing like this church is growing because we love one another. Ken and Sandy are here. I haven't seen them. They haven't been here for quite a while. But when they came in here, what did you get? You got loved on. Amen? Because we love people. And, and that's what Jesus did. So our faith is expressing itself in loving others. And Paul goes on and adds that while these three remain, the greatest of these is love. Well, how is love the greatest? Okay, well, because Paul had already established that love would abide forever. How many of you understand love isn't something that God does? Pardon, pardon me? It's who He is. It's who He is. So it's not just merely something that God does. It's who He is. So love is the greatest because it is one of the one of the one is one quality of the Christian life that will be fully active both now and for eternity. This love that we have is going with us into eternity. Isn't that amazing? So the believer's faith in God is going to be realized and will be realized when we see God face to face. And for, those, uh, for, for where there is sight, faith... Ooh. I remember saying this last week. This will shake you right to the core. Where the believer's faith in God will be realized when we see God face to face. Faith, how many of you understand that faith 
is, is vital for the Christian. Listen, church, if we, want, if we want to please God, there has got to be an element of faith activated in our life. We've got to have faith. Faith has got to be activated. If, you, if we can figure out how to make it all happen, that's not faith. That's figuring it out. It's not our job to figure it out. Our job is to act in faith. And so faith, we, by faith, we believe in Jesus Christ. By faith, we believe in God Almighty. By faith, we believe in the Holy Ghost. By faith, we believe in the heaven above. By faith. Why? Why is that? Because we're here, and they're there. So there's, uh, there's something that is compelling us. There's something that is moving us toward that heavenly realm, and it's this thing called faith. Now listen to this. The believer's faith in God will be realized. In other words, our faith is going to come to fruition. Ken, what does fruition mean? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's completed. So our faith then, our, our faith in God is going to be realized when we see God face to face. Face to face. So listen to this. Where there is sight, where there is sight, faith is no longer needed. When I'm standing before God, when I stand before Jesus Christ, when I'm in, 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 uh, in the embrace of the Holy Ghost, face to face, when, when this mortal puts on immortality, when this body of corruption puts on incorruption, faith will not be involved anymore. Because I'm seeing it. I'll be like, look at that hair. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? Ha <laughs> ha. Lord Jesus. <laughs> I, probably, I probably still ain't going to have hair because God didn't put marble tops on cheap furniture. Amen. <laughs> Wait, listen. Where there is, I want you to grasp this. I want this to be embedded in your, in your mind and in your spirit. That where there is sight, if you can see it, faith isn't involved. You don't have to have faith for something you can see. You've got to have faith for what you can't see. What, what does it say about faith? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The what? The evidence of things what? Of things not seen. Things you can't see. You, what good is faith if you can see it? You have to believe. You have got to believe. So similarly, the believer's hope is going to be fully realized in that day. Love will endure forever as you and I are, and, and those in the new heaven and the new earth continue to love God and his people. So Paul goes on with some very strong statements in 1 Corinthians 13 and the first three verses concerning the importance of love. We're going to talk about, we're going to spend the bulk of our night tonight talking about these statements and talking about love in these verses, which is the, which is the more important, uh, using our gifts or showing love? Showing love. It's always showing love. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, in the first three verses. Though I speak... With the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. Well, why is that? Well, because if we can effectively love one another, church, all the rest of it will come together. If we can just effectively love one another, what? <laughs> Listen, when everything is going good, it's easy to love people. Hey, hey. But when you're down and out and all hell is coming against you, when you're, when you're, maybe, when, when you're maybe making bad choices, I'd, I'd give you 20 bucks for an amen right there. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's in those moments that we need love. It's in those moments. See, when, when we become Christians, we immediately became a child of God. We were immediately placed into a new spiritual family called the body of Christ. The human body functions best when each member fulfills the job that it was created to perform. Amen? The body of Christ is very much the same. It is the healthiest when each member is growing spiritually and fulfilling their unique role. Is love supposed to evolve? Evolve means grow to, to change into something. You mean revolve. Evolve means to change into something. No. No. No, it's not. No, it's not. Love... To, to, to love like the Lord loves us is to love the unlovable. It's to love the unlovable. And so it, it's, it's, it's each one of us, and, and this, is, this, is the, this is the hard sell for the pastors. This is the hard sell for the pastor because every one of you, I don't care whether you're in grade school or, or gray hair, God has a purpose and a plan and a role for every one of you to fulfill. And the church will never be healthy until everybody is doing it. Until everybody's doing their job. So what does it mean to you to know what you or that that you are a part of the body of Christ. What does it mean to you to know that you're a part of the body of Christ? What does it mean to you to in the depths of your soul to know that you're a part of something out of this world? See, it should motivate us to tell others about this this life, this whole thing. It means that. If I want the rest of the body to be healthy, I have to do my part. Yeah. How many of you know that for the body to be healthy, every once in a while, me and that girl need to get out of here so that somebody else can take this spot? Because if it ever becomes all about me and my preaching style, we are in real trouble. So I want to look at the promise 
of the Holy Spirit, the promise of, uh, of the coming of the Holy Spirit. See, it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Joel prophesied in chapter 2, in verse 28 through 32, and, and it shall come to pass. Listen, when God's word says it shall come to pass, guess what? It's coming to pass. It is going to happen. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on some flesh. Oh, on all flesh? Yeah, I was. I was just seeing if he was listening. But now that we're stopped, let's think about it for a minute. What flesh? Now, I did a word study on the word all. I literally did a word study on the word all. And it means the complete sum of. It means all. Just exactly like what you think. So that means his spirit is going to fall on the saved and the unsaved. And it will come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, the, the reaction, and not the reaction, the... Um, oh, what's the word I want? The effectiveness or the effects are going to be different. Everybody's going to get it. But the, the children of God are the ones that are going to respond to it in a correct way. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men. <laughs> I had one eye looking at you and one eye looking at him. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come, it shall come to pass. That whoever, ooh, ooh, mm, these, this is what keeps me fired up. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Woo! Shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Mary, that's going to be a good day. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You know what? We've called on the name of the Lord. And you know what? He heard our cry. See, Peter quotes this same passage in Acts chapter 2 and verses 16 through 21. The outpouring of the Spirit was predicted by Joel and it occurred on, at, at Pentecost in the upper room. Why did it occur? It occurred because they were in one mind and in one accord. They were praying together. They'd been fasting for 10 days. They'd been seeking the Lord. He, Jesus said to them, listen, go into the upper room. And he said, tarry there and pray until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he showed up. And those boys was never the same after that. So while in the past God's Spirit seemed available to kings and, and, and to prophets and to judges, Joel envisioned this is faith. Remember, he, he couldn't see it. He envisioned it. He saw it in his spirit. Joel envisioned a time when the Spirit would be available to every believer. I've talked about it before and I'm still praying God let it happen in my lifetime. I want to see the Shekinah glory. 
I, I, maybe the Lord's waiting until we get in the new building with the really tall ceilings and stuff so that it can just flood that whole place. It's going to just be filled with the Shekinah, the manifest presence of God. Can I just tell you when that happens, ain't nobody going to be the same. Woo, son. It is going to be a great day. I'm believing God for that. <laughs> the other morning... <laughs> This is the way the world thinks. The other morning, I'm driving to work. It's dark. I'm going up the North River. And because of the fires, a lot of ge geological things uh, have changed in the structure and the rocks. And a lot of every, nearly every morning, I drive up the river, and there's rocks in the road. And some of them are this big around. Some of them are baseball size. There was a rock about the size of the top of my podium here laying in the road and if somebody would have come around the corner and hit that thing it would have been bad and so I stopped in my log truck turned my flashers on and rolled this big rock out of the road well when I got to the job everybody was talking about this big rock there have been four rigs past this rock well I didn't want to stop because I was afraid somebody would run like there's a lot of traffic at three o'clock in the morning on the time you know and, and and they're like, well, I didn't want to stop. Maybe, you know, somebody could run over me or whatever. And I said, they, I said, well, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, did you move it? I said, yeah, I did. Well, yeah, you got Jesus on your side. <laughs> That's exactly what they said. Well, you got Jesus on your side. <laughs> You're exactly right. Yeah. Oh, Lord Jesus. That's the way the world, we can't do it. We're on our own, but he can. He's got Jesus. <laughs> Amazing. There's coming a time, church, when God's Spirit is going to be available to every believer. Every believer. It's here now. Ezekiel also spoke of an outpouring of the Spirit in Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 28 and 29. I, don't, I didn't write, I don't have it here, but God's Spirit is available today. Listen, today. God's Spirit is here today to anybody who will call on the Lord for salvation. Listen, church, I'm looking for a time when, when I, I don't want it like it was in the old days, okay? I don't want it like it was in the old days. That was the old days. I want, I want the old days right now. And the only way it's going to happen is when we bring back the prayer room. When we bring back getting to the altar and crying out at the altar until God shows up. People need to be anointed with oil, have hands laid on them, and to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That when we lay hands on somebody, we begin to see evidence of things happening in their lives. When we begin to see blinded eyes. Listen, I want that. God said in His Word, it's available to you and I. Amen. He said we should be able to, to, to pray that the dead come back to life. It's not going to happen, church, until we begin to pray. I mean pray. I mean get a hold of the horns of the altar and pray till hell can't stand it anymore. God's Spirit's available today to everybody that will call on the Lord for salvation. The wonders would give a hint or a picture of a coming event. And the, and the day of the Lord is used here as God's appointed time to judge the nations. But listen, judgment and mercy go hand in hand. Judgment and mercy go hand in hand. Joel said that if the people repented, the Lord would save them from judgment. You know why? Because all of our all of our chastisement Jesus took. So in the day of judgment and catastrophe, some will be saved. Some will be saved. God's intention is not to destroy, but to heal and to save. You got to understand, church, that God said explicitly in his word that he is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to salvation. Now that don't mean everybody's going to get saved. It simply means that God's not willing that any would perish. 
It, in other words, it's not in his will. How do I know it's not in his will? Because he sent his only son to die for you and me. To hang on a cross, to bear the stripes, to take the beating. We just, we just celebrated the Lord's Supper on Sunday. We talked about all of that stuff. What Jesus went through to redeem us and to purchase our salvation talks of the love that he has. It talks about his unwillingness that any would, 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 would not make heaven their home. And we have to, I, I have to say this, if you go to hell, if you go to hell, it's because you chose to go there. It's not because God sent you there. It's not because God said you have to go to hell. It's because you refused to accept the redemption work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so you have no other option but hell. Smoking or non-smoking, you choose. Joshua said in chapter 24, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Joshua said, hey... As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. God's intention is not to destroy, but to heal. However, you and I must accept His salvation, or we will certainly perish with the unrepentant. That's just the natural outflow. It's called rebellion. It's called rejection. The afterword in, in chapter 2 and verse 28 refers to the events that are described in chapter 2 of verse 18 through 27 when the Lord heals the nation after the Assyrian invasion. But it doesn't necessarily mean immediately afterward because many centuries passed before the Spirit was poured out. When Peter quoted this verse in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit led him to interpret afterward to mean in the last days. And so the last days, just so, just so that everybody's clear, in the last days, the last days began with the ministry of Christ on earth. You can reference that in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. And here's the other thing. It will conclude with the day of the Lord which is that period of worldwide judgment that is also called the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. I don't know what camp you're in tonight, pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. I'm going out on the first load. Period. Amen? Glory to God. Many students of prophecy think that this special time is, is detailed in Revelations chapter 6 through chapter 19, climaxing with the return of Christ to earth to deliver Israel and to establish his kingdom. Joel promised that before the day of the Lord begins, there will be a remarkable outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which again is accompanied by signs in the heaven and on the earth. Listen. When the heavens start showing signs of God and things like that, the sun goes dark and the moon turns to blue. How many of you know that's going to get some folks' attention? There are going to be some people going, hmm. Pardon me? Yes, we did. And people are like, what in the world? It's happening. It's coming. It's, listen, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, listen, y'all don't have to be scared. You just have to be ready. Yeah. And it's factual. It's, it's not some fairy tale we're talking about. It's the truth. <laughs> During the Old Testament era, the Holy Spirit was, was given only to special people who had special jobs to do, like Moses and, and some of the, and the prophets and judges and, and great men like David. But the promise that God gave through Joel declared that the Spirit will come upon all flesh, which means men, women, young, old, Jew, Gentile, Greek, Hebrew. It doesn't make a lick bit of difference. Everybody's going to get a dose of the ghost. Hello. It's going to happen. Look at what it says. And it shall come to pass. Say, it shall come to pass. 
That should be a declaration. We ought to declare that. It shall come to pass. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We've seen that Sunday after Sunday in these altars where people are coming and surrendering their life to Jesus. Do I want to see blinded eyes open? Yes. Do I want to hear, see deaf ears unstopped? Yes. Do I want to see the lame walk? Yes. Do I want to see Kathy completely healed? Do I want to see Ken completely healed? Yes, I do. But the, and those are fantastic, great miracles. But they don't compare to someone being born again. There's no greater miracle than somebody coming to the salvation of Jesus Christ. So, I lost, I, I lost track of where I was. So, we're talking about the promise of the coming Holy Spirit and the fact that it was prophesied in, in the Old Testament and it was also promised by Jesus in the New Testament. See, it was prophesied. To, to prophesy something is something of old that is, is told uh, uh, and declared that is going to happen at, at, at down the road somewhere. And so Joel prophesied that. How did he prophesy it? He, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he prophesied that. And then Jesus comes along, and Jesus takes the promise a step further, or takes the prophecy a step further, and turns it now into a promise. Amen? Amen. The promise is in the New Testament, in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, and he said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. That's talking about the, the impartation of the Holy Spirit when we get saved. So there's all kinds of different translations that use different words for the Holy Spirit here. Some call him an advocate. What's an advocate? Pardon me? To go between? Give me one word. It's God. God's calling. God's calling Sharon. What's he saying? <laughs> He's saying, pray for the pastor because I'm going to kill him. <laughs> <sighs> Amen. Listen, in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, it was promised by Jesus, and he said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive, but because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. These other translations, again, I, I, I'm trying to get back to where I was so I can carry my thought train along. But these different translations use different words for the Holy Spirit. And advocate is one. And, and we've established that an advocate is like a lawyer or an attorney. He's also a helper. He's also a helper. How many of you have called on the Holy Spirit for help? Oh, God, I need your help. Holy Spirit, help me. How many of you have called on him as your comforter? The comfort of God? I mean, you're just, you're just having a mess. And you just need comfort. And you need peace. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Greek word parakletos denotes the helper or the counselor who's always there to give special care in times of need. He's always there. He's the paraclete. He'll never leave you. He said in his word, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We see it here in, in this verse of scripture that he will abide with you forever in verse 16. What does that mean that he will abide with you forever? Pardon me? Forever. 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 So what if you're doing stupid stuff? He's still with you. 
So when we're doing stupid stuff, we're dragging the Holy Ghost right through our stupid stuff right with us. And does he say, I've had enough of this, I'm out of here. He doesn't leave you. He stays right with you. Why? Because he wants to, he brings to your life and to your heart conviction. Why? To make you feel bad? No, because conviction, the end result of conviction is, in, in a perfect sense, is correction. When, 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 when you arrest somebody for breaking the law, you, you arrest them, they go to court, they are convicted of their, of their offense, and they are put in, maybe they're put into jail or whatever. What's the purpose? Just to keep them out of society? No, it, the, the purpose is that there's a hope that there's going to come correction. Pardon me? Oh, we certainly do grieve the Holy Spirit. We can, the, when we do the stupid stuff that men can't have done, it grieves the Holy Spirit. But he's, even though he's grieved, he doesn't leave us. There's something of him that says, I've got, you know, he just, he, he, it, listen, he is the eternal optimist. He's always hoping that some way, somehow, I'm going to make a difference in this person's life. And, and you know what? Here's the reality. Most often, it's not by the miraculous things that he's done. It's the fact that in the, our worst moments, he never left us. When I was at my absolute worst, he never left me. He was always there just nudging me, just bumping me. Oh. When I just, when, when, when you just want to end it all, maybe, hey, I love you. I want you to know that I love you. I, I love you. You have value. So the Holy Spirit is more than a comforter. He's more than a helper. He's more than a counselor. He is an advocate and he's an encourager. You can do it. You can do it. In this context, it's also clear that the Holy Spirit is the Son's representative, even as the Son was the Father's representative. So the expression, another counselor, means another counselor of the same kind as the first. And so when, Je when Jesus was here, and he, say, he left, and he went to the Father, he said, I'm going to send you the paraclete. I'm going to send you another counselor. And the other counselor is exactly like the counselor that just left in Jesus. Because it's His Holy Spirit. So when Jesus would no longer be with the disciples physically, the Holy Spirit would be their constant companion to guide, to help, and empower them for the tasks ahead. Listen, we need the help and the power of the Holy Ghost of God. We need it. We need to walk in it. We need to live in it. Listen, it, remember... Um, when I was talking about the marathons and stuff, and Bob had, had alluded to running marathons, and, and I preached on it the next Sunday, and, and I, I used all of that. And, and the Bible says that we need to get rid of those things that weigh us down and the sins that so easily beset us. Listen, church, I want for us as a corporate body to this next week between, uh, you know, in your prayer time, I want you to just begin to uh, unload some of that mess. Some of us are carrying stuff around. We've been carrying it around for years. I have a person in our church, and I'm not at liberty right now to say who it is, but there is a person in our church that is driving miles and miles, hundreds of miles with the hope of bringing restoration between two people that has been going on for four years. But the Spirit of God has begun to work in this person, and, and, and he, this person felt compelled to go and try and make rest or to, um, um, restoration with this person. That's the things I'm talking about. To, because those are the things, church, that will weigh you and I down. Because it's always in the back of your mind. Well, what about that? Because the devil's going to remind you. Well, what about that? 
What about this? What about the other thing? What about something else? Well, let me just tell you something, devil. I drove for 20 hours or whatever it was to take care of that problem. It's no longer in my deal. And that's what I'm talking about. There's things that we need to shed off of ourselves so that we are free to move in the, in the Spirit of God. Amen? I hope you're getting something out of this. I'll tell you what it is. I know what you're going to say. If it doesn't work, if there isn't restoration, is that what you're going to say? I'll tell you what it means. It means you did your part. That person, the Bible says this, go to your brother. That's your problem. That's your job. That's your duty. You go to them. Whether or not they receive it is off your back. You've done your part. You've gone to make restoration. You've done your part. You've said, listen, I, and, and, and in 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 humility, with a humble and a contrite heart, you, you, you don't just go down there and say, listen, listen, I know, I know back then, you know, whatever, this and that, and so you got to uh, forgive me. Okay? Because I need to get on with my life. See that? Pardon me? That's the wrong attitude. That ain't going to get you anywhere. But when you come to somebody with a humble and a contrite heart and say, listen, man, I was out of line. What I did was wrong. The way I responded was wrong. The actions that I did were wrong. And I'm simply here, humbly, asking you to forgive me. What they do with that is on them. You have done your part. You walk away from that situation knock the dust off your shoes or whatever you want to, however you want to call it, and you move on. You don't let that thing stay on you anymore. You've done your part. You can't, you can't control the other person. Amen? Amen. Amen. Where in the world am I at now? So yeah, so Jesus identifies the counselor as the one who leads into all truth because he is the spirit who reveals the truth about God. And it might seem at first that the whole world at large cannot receive the spirit because of the sin and disobedience. But if that was the case, nobody would receive him. Because we're all of us have sin and we've all been disobedient. It's a heart issue. And we've got to understand that. There ain't a one of us in here that's perfect. Not one of us. But my heart is striving to be like Jesus. My heart is striving to love people. And I think that's what he wants. If we... Uh, in, the world can't receive this spirit of truth because the world isn't looking for it and doesn't recognize it. What does the Bible say about opening the eyes of our enlightenment? That happens when you get saved. <laughs> something comes along, something happens, and the lights come on, and it's like, whoa, hey, hey. So the same way that Jesus wasn't accepted by the world, the Spirit would also not be really received. But the disciples and all believers can receive the Spirit because Jesus said, but you do because He lives with you now and later will be in you. Amen? Amen. I'm stopping. I'm done. Church, I'm telling you, if we can begin to get a grip on this, if we can begin to comprehend the power of what it means to love somebody, to hug somebody, to tell them, hey, I love you, 
I pray God blesses you. I, 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 a, a, a truck driver, I've never seen him before in all my life, pulled up behind me in the road construction today, and, and I always get out and unhook my safety chain and stuff, get ready to get my trailer off and this and that. And this, he, he, just a little old man, he come hobbling up. How long are we going to be? I said, we're about ready to go now, so you better head back to your truck, you know, because it's going to take you a minute to get there. He turned around and he said, I hope you have a really great day, and God bless you a bunch. I said, well, God bless you too, brother. God bless you. And I just jumped back to my truck. I was like, and he's, <laughs> I wanted to pick him up and carry him to his truck. Blessed me, man. Like, whoa! We are not alone. They are amongst us. Whoa! <laughs> Amen. Listen, church, if you'll look for him, he's out there. If you'll be that kind of person to the world, that guy didn't know I was a Christian. I didn't have nothing on that said Jesus, nowhere. I had a fluorescent orange safety shirt on and a pair of jeans and suspenders. Nothing about what I was wearing said that guy's a Christian. But that old man took a step of faith and said, Hey, buddy, have a great day. God bless you a bunch. Tell somebody God bless you. I don't care whether they like it or not. It'll make you feel good. Won't it? Won't it? We don't have to be ugly about it. Well, God bless you. <laughs> hey, hey, that ain't going to do you no good, y'all. It's the wrong attitude. It's the delivery. Man, I pray God blesses you today. I pray God just blesses you. Amen? Let God use you this week. Let, invite somebody to church. We had people here a couple weeks ago, and, and they were only here because somebody said, hey, you, you want to go someplace where it's really fun in church? <laughs> yeah, they came. Crazy. And I asked them afterwards, was it fun? Yeah. Yeah. Invite somebody. Tell them. I know a place where you can get love. The God kind of love. Not weird love. God love. Amen? Amen? Father, I love you tonight. God, I can't do any of this without you. Holy Spirit, I, I feel your presence in this place. I can feel your presence in this place. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely, the presence of the Lord is in this place. We love You, Lord. We love You, Lord. God, I ask that You would saturate us tonight with Your Spirit, with Your presence, I pray, God, for those watching tonight by way of the Internet, that your Holy Spirit would just saturate them. God, that your Holy Spirit would just endue them with love. Love, love, love. God, the kind of love that would, would provoke someone from a state of, of failure to thrive, to a place of productivity in the spiritual realm. Father, I pray this week that lives would be refreshed. This preacher needs a refreshing. God, I need refreshed. I need rest. My wife needs rest. We need your Holy Spirit to refresh and revive us. So, Lord, I pray for that. I pray that this place is full to overflowing on Sunday with people hungry for more of God, with people that come into this place with a willingness to put their agenda aside and love one another. I pray, God, that you'd bring to our remembrance maybe somebody that we need to make a phone call or drive across town or drive across the, 
the country and make amends and get things right. Shed shed the sin that so easily besets us. That we can walk and run with the things of God. Father, I thank you again for our offering. I thank you again that very soon there's going to be a building erected right out there. I thank you, God, that the finances are coming in. They're on their way. God, and I thank you for your faithfulness to to, to see to that end, Lord. God, I praise your holy name. God, I praise your holy name. Lord, I pray that a, a spirit of prayer would well up in your people. God, that it wouldn't be just a now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer, but it would be a prayer where we grab a hold of the horns of the altar and we don't let go until God has moved us and touched us. And Lord, for that we're grateful. For that we thank you. For that we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen Amen. and amen. Hey, thanks again for watching tonight on the internet. Uh, I I pray that this blessed you, and uh, I, I pray you'll join us again on Sunday morning. Amen? God bless you, and God go with you until then. Good night.